Uh, this presentation is being sponsored by the Writers Guild of America. Our motto, if you have a plot, hire a professional. Um, <laughs> if you don't, make a game. <laughs> Before we begin, we're going to be showing uh, clips from Psychic Detective that depict characters in extreme psychic torment. Uh, if you are experiencing likewise because of hangover this morning, don't sit by the speakers. <laughs> um, and a note about showing clips from a game or an interactive movie. Uh, it, 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 looking at clips instead of playing them is a little like looking at a court transcript of a Robin Williams monologue. You're going to get the gist of it, and you're going to appreciate a lot of it, but you're going to be painfully aware that something is missing for you. And in this case, it's uh, making decisions and making choices and having the movie instantly react to you. Uh, what I asked John to do was assemble what we refer to as the Psychic Detective Cliff Notes. Uh, how many people have actually played Psychic Detective at least once from beginning to end? All right. For the many uninitiated, we're going to take you through a breakneck tour of what this is about and then talk a little bit about the pragmatic challenges of trying to create this kind of animal. Uh, so, with no further ado, uh, maybe a little further ado. I was just I was just going to say that uh, it's a title that we created with Electronic Arts. It's um, published on the 3DO, PlayStation, and PC CD-ROM formats. Um, it's five hours worth of live action material, which you are playing through 20 to 40 minutes at a time. And that yes. was basically it. Beautiful. We refer to it as an interactive film that's 30 minutes long and five hours wide. But more to come. Here's your basic high concept. A little... A little non-interactive intro which tells you something about the main character and the plot. Thank you. 
Who's the toy boy? Where's Mr. Mirage? Meet him at the tea room at 10 o'clock. if you want to sit back and just watch the movie. We allow you to do that as well. Late in the game, yes? Oh, I was just going to say that uh, that that it's, it may be obvious or not obvious, but every time you take advantage of something, you're changing what's going to happen next. Obviously, when we touch the object, um, Sylvia reacted to the fact, and we, we knew something a little bit more about Sylvia, um, the blonde woman with the Mirage Quest pin. Um, when we told Chad to get lost, we were active, and um, the objects that appeared afterwards would only appear if we had told Chad to get lost. If we do things throughout the entire movie, we're going to change what is and is not available to us as we play through. That's the idea of creating a narrative that works like a nervous system. And you make one choice up here, and it's telling the entire story what you've done, and uh, it's going to ripple all the way through. Now, so what we want to demonstrate now is Late in the story, you come, to, uh, you come to Sylvia, you're looking for notebook containing vital pieces of information. If you sit back and do nothing, the scene might unfold like this. You're in the wrong room. Don't we ever get a scene together? You know what Max is doing? I was just in his head, writing a little poem for the princess. You're so far on the rebound, you haven't stopped bouncing. Screw you! One way of getting even, but I hit hard. You can't compete with a trophy wife. She's nothing. Nothing? She's adorable. What's he need you around for anyway? Pest control. Let's look at it again and 
in this case, John is going to activate the collector. You're in the wrong room. makes it different from uh, other products that call themselves interactive movies. Uh, the most popular entertainments out there that are interactive movies tend to work a certain way. You get a bit of film, and then you have to solve a puzzle, and then you get some more movie, and then you have to solve a puzzle, a little more movie, a puzzle that could last 60 minutes before you get more film. Those are very entertaining experiences, but what they lose is a sense of film time. I mean, what we respond to in movies, what we think is great, is the relentless pace. The fact is, films and even TV shows, they don't pause, with the possible exception of Winky Dink, you know, which was the grandfather of all interactive movies. We'll do a seminar on Winky Dink later. We will. But what happens is, if the movie is hurtling by, then you've got to make your choices on the fly. If you're wondering what's going to happen next, even as it's happening next, and trying to decide, well, what's the proper decision to do here, you know, we think that becomes an interesting experience. And it's, it, it comes from the fact that we decided to tie all of the different prompts to the dramatic action. Right. It also means that what we're doing is we are treating the film as the puzzle itself. Uh, because you are sitting there and deciding whose head should I jump into, what object should I touch, what thought should I throw, when should I use the collector, and by doing that, you're editing the movie on the fly, which is, to people from Hollywood, a very sacrilegious <laughs> phrase to say, but it is honestly what goes on here. It, it seemed like a good idea, because, <laughs> because if you set up a set of characters, those characters are operating according to traits which you have communicated to the audience. Those traits, for us, were themselves a set of rules that certain characters are going to do certain things, and if we, if we push the characters into different emotional arenas, they're going to react in character, according to the rules that we've set out for them. And if we think about that challenge as being the beginning of the game, then the puzzle aspect is threaded throughout the entire experience, because we're asking you not to figure out who done it, but to figure out why everybody done it, why John, John everybody's like doing things. John likes to call it a who done it instead of a why done it and I like that very much because an interactive story is horizontal by nature. It's got to be wide. There's got to be a lot of parallel possibilities existing side by side. There's got to be a lot of backstory and a lot of subplots that you can wander at will. A who done it is going to basically build to one plot point answer. And once you know it, end of story. A why done it can be about the fact that A did this to B, later on C did this to A, now A, B, and C are going to meet over here, unless of course D finds out about it, that becomes a much wider map of story, and there are a lot more possibilities that you've got to uncover and connect. I mean, films, we think, lend themselves to this sort of puzzle method because 
they're so fragmented to begin with. It, it is a puzzle. A film is a puzzle Absolutely. that's been assembled for you. You know, it begins at the writing stage where you're putting your scenes on index cards and trying to decide what's the proper order. You're breaking it down into the pieces that you're going to shoot most efficiently for production. And then the editor and the director are sitting together and they're stitching together the most meaningful whole. Now, what if you made a Rubik's Cube of a film where there was more than one meaningful whole and where each different sequence and different order that you might put together was going to give you a different kind of experience. That's what we're dealing with here. One of the ways that you do that is to play with time and sequencing. Uh, you set certain actions in stone within the story and you allow the player to come to them at their own pace in their own order. The, that, yeah, they're, they're essentially dramatic modules right. that have uh, different entrances and exits and can be altered depending on previous action. And if those dramatic modules are attached to a certain number of set in stone tent poles, people can play through experiences in different time order with different emotional states and different sets of knowledge, uh, both in the player's mind and the character's minds, when they approach those different modules. So here are a few givens, and we'll show you how they play out. Uh, the fourth collector is hidden over here. Um, there is a blackmail scheme, very dangerous, going on over here. Uh, the old lady is waiting for us in the mansion here, and Sylvia is going to show up and try and kill her. And down the hall in the mansion is a hidden room, which you may or may not have found out about. At a certain part in our movie, uh, our hero, Eric Fox, is going to return to the mansion to see the old lady. And the fact is, this can happen a number of different ways, depending upon what order you've taken things. Uh, he can show up, and he can know absolutely she nothing. She says it has to be you all along. I trust you behave yourself. And swim, but ripping your own throat with sharp hooves. I love that old world folklore. Quiet! You joke and fumble when you must face the killer himself. Only two options appear because we know nothing. Let's see. The best of the black diamond. That is your max mirage. Now, we went to the blackmail scheme, and we got psychically fried. We're showing up a moron. But we're able to save the old lady. On the other hand, perhaps you got the collector, but too late. 
of these dramatic modules in time, um, and also something in which the variables are shifted um, because of what you've done previously through the movie. So we tried to track and estimate what you would know at that point and what the hero would know. From a production standpoint, we did a very smart thing early on, and it's something we had done um, with Jim at Electronic Arts, which is that we played the game on paper with um, a lot of different people, not only to get their reaction to the tone, the kind of interaction, and the scale of what we were trying to attempt, um, but it was a useful thing because we had a 500-page script, which Michael wrote, and for most productions, um, that seems impossible. Um, the limits of physical video production are that you need the cast and crew on site to be able to turn out usually maybe five or six pages of dialogue a day if you're moving at a real clip in, in terms of making a motion picture. With 500 pages, we had about 20 days to shoot, in fact, exactly 20 days in which to shoot all the material, um, which meant that we were covering a great deal more than five or six pages a day. And in order to be able to do this and not go crazy, we did some things in production that made a lot of sense. 
we lit a lot of the environments we were working in theatrically so that we could shoot more than one or two angles at a time. In fact, in some instances, we could shoot an entire 360 degree number of setups uh, looking at different actors from different angles because of our switch of POV or building the scene in traditional filmic style with wide shots, masters, and, uh, and close-ups, twos, and, and singles. Um, the other thing that we did when we played the game beforehand was we educated the cast and crew to understand why something that might seem abrupt and completely discontinuous, uh, even though it, we were shooting out of continuity order, would make a certain amount of game sense um, because of what we were intending. So after a while, even though the actor were porting around a, uh, a shrunken copy of a 500-page script, um, they were well-versed enough in knowing the threads of the drama to be able to know exactly why they were doing things. For example, Sylvia's reactions to being pulled off Madame T, there's seven, eight, nine different ways that she's stopped from killing the old lady. Um, she had to know each time what was going on in the plot so that she could react to it because something that's subtle in her performance is what she does and doesn't know, what the bad guy Max Mirage has been keeping from her, and what's in the foreground. It's one of the things that you as Eric Fox can use to elucidate stuff. You can use her jealousy of Monica to your advantage, but the, the performer has to be able to communicate that to you in a subtle sort of way so you know what her state of mind is, which also means that we're setting you up for the throwing of thoughts at various characters, because if you throw a aggression, submission, or affection at particular characters, you're going to get different reactions depending on who they are at that moment. We might get something we like from the bouncer by throwing affection. If we ever try throwing affection at Sylvia in certain circumstances, she's really going to take it the wrong way. Um, you know, so from a production standpoint, we did a number of uh, kind of interesting things, and in fact, we found that the actors, after a while, um, were a little bit more on the ball about exactly where we were coming from and where we were going, because we were we were concentrating too much on uh, the actual details of production. So there was a great advantage to to um, to playing the game in advance with everybody. Come back around now to um, the idea of the film as a puzzle. We were looking at how you can play the movie in different orders and how that's meaningful. The other idea is that we're trying to get our audience to connect the dots visually. You know, our supposition is any one of you sat on an airplane and watched the movie without headphones, you'd know what happened in the story. You could tell us the story without necessarily having listened to it or even paid extremely close attention to it. Uh, when John talks about it being a why done it, We've taken a great deal of the backstory and of the subplot and literally chopped it up and scattered it around the movie. We've sort of turned the film or the story into a landscape and we want the player to wander through and find different moments and slowly start to connect them. What the hell is the screaming cat about? You will eventually learn that if you happen to come to the right place for it. Uh, doing things like having psychic memories, being able to read the history of people and having psychic clashes allows us to create these sort of sequences. Right. We're going we're gonna to now take a look at reading the psyche of the arch villain, Max Mirage. <laughs> something yeah. along they, yeah along with being abstract yes there are there are lots of moments throughout the piece in which we are very very explicit about what things mean so in a way what we wanted was we wanted the the thoughts and ideas to percolate in everybody's head through multiple viewings and then when when the 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 apparentness of what things mean occurs to people and they get to the right place at the right time there is an explicit explanation of what they may have thought that was going on. Uh, in the process of putting together a story that works this way, 
you are inevitably going to want to shuttle the player to certain areas. Uh, you can call these areas funnels or bottlenecks, but they are a pain in the ass because yeah. you know that they're going to see them a number of times or they're going to pass through this area a number of times. Uh, Although we figured out a way around this recently. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> in, the, in the end, you know, the, the true answer, I think, is to have the player and the computer construct those sequences almost on a shot-by-shot -shot basis, doing montages on the fly. In Psychic Detective, we tried a couple of solutions. Uh, we didn't necessarily cover all of our bases, but a number of times we used two methods. The first is to create a short scene that is really like the hub of a wheel. It has a lot of different options coming out of it. So even though you're going to hit it a number of times, you can go different places with it. Right. And, and one of the things I think that you may have noticed about Psychic is that when you decide to take action, when you decide to um, either jump into somebody else's head, touch an object, or respond to an action prompt, you are cutting off the, uh, the moment that you're in the middle of, and you're jumping to another moment. Um, so we good night. And this is a prime example of that. You can touch That's your keychain. Just a little more. I do not trust this mirage quest. You're going? Stop her. I have to. You Don't ask why. Just hate me if you must. You can take her for help. You can follow her. Or what John has chosen to do. Go home, you idiot. You can jump in her head. How come I never thought about going home? You think I don't know? I can't feel you. Sliding around in the back of my head. Bye. We spent a lot of time talking about um, the, the combination of reward and frustration. Um, what can we reward people with as they play through Psychic Detective, and what level of frustration are people going to feel because they don't understand what's going on? And we, we decided explicitly to throw people into the soup in the very beginning in the exact position of our main character, which is you've been led into a film noir world, you've been lied to, and you've got to figure things out because your ass is on the line. We are anticipating that People are going to bring their personalities to playing Psychic Detective. Some people are going to simply sit back and let the movie play, and the movie will talk to them and tell them a great deal of story. Some people are going to jump in and touch everything that comes up first. It's the first thing they're going to do. They're going to just grab anything that comes up. There are rewards and frustrations for that. We're going to meet out equal, equal amounts of that was a good move and maybe that wasn't exactly the brightest thing. So that people will adjust their rhythm to the rhythms that we've put in front of them. The rhythms of the characters, the rhythms of the videos of the scenes, and the rhythms of the, the available choices that come up depending on what they've done. Another way then to deal with funnel points is uh, of course to have different variations of the scene. Uh, in this particular case, in time where the little weasel named Moki is picking you up after you come out of jail, you may know different things. The movie is going to track that and the scene and the appropriate scenes are going I to just play. Want to use the damn thing. You want a collector? We can get one on Brook Street. Sure, sure, and a genuine Rolex. The fourth collector is in a pawn shop. We know these. We're positive. Oh, baby! Do you realize what we could do with two collectors? Pick a country. Be an emperor. We got Lexi by the balls. Excuse me? Ah, don't play dumb. You think the Max Mirage comes out of nowhere? New face, new act, same old slime dog. Lexi, go listen. I just want to use the damn thing. Kid, this is white hot. We snag a collector. We're big league. Psychic mercenaries. You with the brain, me with the Rolodex. That collector belongs to Lena. The hell it does. I shelled out cash four years ago. So you say. Don't you get it? Lexi never died. A face job and a lounge act worse than yours. Max Mirage? No, Wayne Newton. Come on, dude. Get with a beat. <laughs> So if, if you've actually gone with Moki to this drop, it means that you did a, a handful of things earlier in the movie. 
and we realize that at this point the vital piece of information you need to know is that Max Mirage, our present day bad guy, is actually a, a rather evil uh, ex-Soviet spy named Lexi Golitsyn in disguise. The best metaphor that I know for uh, an interactive story or playing an interactive story is, is ironically a feature film, and that's Groundhog Day, uh, where the player is really Bill Murray. You are in a, a universe that is full of rules with actions that are fixed in time. You've got to decide how you're going to behave, how you are going to deal with everything, and what you're ultimately trying to do is be in the right place at the right time and be the best possible version of yourself to be able to advance and to break the cycle. One of the things an interactive movie has to do is let you know how you did. Uh, throughout the film, we try and talk back to you and have characters let you know not only how you're behaving, but what you've accomplished and what you might know. But what all of this is ultimately building to is something that is referred to throughout the movie, which is Black Diamond. And Black Diamond is both a physical board game, but more importantly, a mind game, a psychic battle that is going to take place. Uh, it's unavoidable. It is sort of our high noon showdown. And yet there are so many different ways that you can head into it, uh, depending upon not only what you know, but who you've helped, who may still be alive, who may be stronger because you found secrets that could heal them, all of those things are taken into account. So we, does Jim want to say anything about? No, we need to see yeah. Okay, we'll take a look at it first. Okay. So. You have your ugly thoughts. That's the bad guy. Your little demons. I have mine. And he's turning on all four collectors. ones are stronger. And he's sending us into a psychic battleground space, which is Black Diamond. So at the very beginning, you've got eight possible icons out of a total of 32. They reflect how you've played through the movie and what we think you know. You pick the first four, and Max will pick the other four. You're trying to pick the four that you think are the strongest for you that you understand. Max gets the others. I never move first. It would be bad manners. And then basically you're battling him. You're playing what you think is a strong piece for you against a, what you think is a weak piece Maximum for him. max. Maximum obedience. Maximum fight. Silence! A lot of characters like Lena and Madame Tikunov, the old lady and our heroine. Did you really think you could be her knight in shining armor? I wanted to help. Too bad. You just damned her to hell. <laughs> characters can be in different states by the time we get here. In fact, at this point, Madame T is a very strong icon, and Lena was a very weak one. Be careful, boys. She'll suck you dry. She needs you to keep herself strong. The only thing she needs is your ass on a platter. And it looks like we're going down here. No! Mm, that one was particularly tasty. The damn thing is red. Well, take notes for some other lifetime. Yes, in fact, Max is going to triumph. Is that the best you can do? Sacrifice yourself? So we get one of 14 possible conclusions to the movie, depending on how we played through and how we played the game. War. You are so handsome. Oh, I'm bringing it. So full of blood. Up the balls. Trouble war! If only I could die. the game will tell you which of the 14 conclusions you triggered. And it will give you a little hint for your next play through, which is based on something you didn't see the first time. Right. 
Um, we've been talking a lot about the puzzle and the movie being the same beast. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate now to, uh, to hear from Mr. Simmons, who in many ways was safeguarding the agenda of the game itself and dealing with two people who had never made a game before and uh, were prepared to run wild. Um, yeah, I guess uh, just to sort of finish up on the Black Diamond game part of it and, and what Michael had said about needing to find a way for um, the game to talk back um, to the player, um, you know, the the conversational model that we talk about in interactive design a lot, you know, the player thinks of something, says it into the game through the interface, um, the computer analyzes that input, thinks about it, formulates a response, and now something's different when we think about it. Um, during the course of an interactive drama, there's less of that than we're accustomed to um, in, a, in a gaming experience where the conversational loop is really tight. Other than the kinds of things like um, we do something and in the next scene we mention it to Moki and Moki goes, oh, you know, what you don't know is, and then he gives us some stuff back so that the, the feedback loop is slower at that point. But in order to, to think of, if you want to think of I'm winning the game, I'm accomplishing some particular goal, then what you're able to do in this very, very simple little board game of these these eight icons have values relative to each other and they, they may come and go depending on if your brain's been fried, your your the value of the pieces you're playing with are lessened because you just don't have the powers. Um, so the feedback loop in terms of win loss, if that's the way the player wants to come, you know, think about the experience for themselves, and some people think about it that way, and some people don't, um, is very long. It's 30 minutes long, but because the piece is only 20 to 40 minutes long, people will sit down and in one sitting go through that loop two or three times um, to, to see what, how they're doing and grow a lot from doing it. One of the things that we had no idea if it was going to work or not, which is why we played it on paper so many times, um, Michael playing the role of Mr. Memory and standing in front of somebody and just playing the game for them all day long. I mean, we'd bring people in, lock them in this room, and they'd play the thing for, you know, eight times. I'm having bad flashbacks. Uh, yeah. Well, um, and... Uh, what I had to sit in there and referee because he would have this tendency to want to help people out a little bit. And so the way the way he would play the game is he would describe the scene and all those little icons that are around the screens we had three by five cards of and he would slide them forward and they were available and Madam T walks out of the room and her icon disappears and somebody would be, oh, no, nope, you can't have it. And But he would want to go, okay, you can have it back. <laughs> um, so we would play all the way through, and we would get to the end, and we'd pull out this board and put it on the table and, and have all these little icons spread around, and, you know, and Michael would um, figure out which icons had to go on, and then some of them sort of, um, depending on how the story goes, all eight may be dictated by the playthrough you've done. Perhaps four are dictated, and the four we go grab kind of at random, you know, okay, let's... Uh, one of the women in, let's bring a minor character in. You know, we haven't used the skull in a time or two, let's bring that in. Um, and we throw that on there. And we didn't tell anybody anything about what they were supposed to do, other than, you know, you can you can pick this piece up and move it. And they try to go, you know, all the way around the board and say, no, you can't move it that far. Oh, okay. And, and so we they do it, and then we would take the two pieces and, you know, do the little kid's game of like, and this one stays. And then he would describe the movie that would play as a result of it. I mean, the, the first time we did it, people were just totally baffled. And they just thought, this is, you know, this makes no sense whatsoever. And we go, yeah, okay, let's make a note of that. It makes no sense whatsoever. And then they'd play it a second time. And they would see a correlation between 
what they had done before and what had happened the second time, they would notice that, oh, these are different icons that came up this time, that came up the time before. Um, oh, they noticed that. Okay, that's a good thing. Um, and after about the third time, they would begin to formulate some firmly held opinions about what's going on here and here's what I'm going to do the next time and I'm going to go after this and I'm going to get that and I know, and they were dead wrong, but they had formulated an opinion, they had made a commitment, they, they were starting to... They'd gotten involved. Um, yeah, they were engaged. And after about the fifth time, they had some firm opinions and some of them were right. And they could see that they were right in that feedback mechanism, you know, okay, if the cigarettes, you know, if I've got the cigarette and such and such has happened and I see that skull and I do that, I know every single time that that's what's going to happen. So they start formulating um, uh, a set of patterns which sometimes results in I've got to see a certain movie um, repeatedly, but more often doesn't. And they vectored toward improvement and getting things to happen the way they wanted them to with very, very, with no instruction manual hints and help. Um, they, they put that together and that's when we realize, okay, it's going to work um, and that this feedback mechanism that we've structured at the end does allow them to put the whole story together and know what's going on and why and to feel like they have some power over control in it and having control in an interactive experience over what's going on instead of just feeling at the mercy of arbitrary design decisions is uh, is a real challenge and so we felt like we did a pretty good job with that. In many ways our hope is that we find an audience for Psychic Detective that has uh, a series of reactions to the material. The first is the impulse to win or to play it as well as possible. The second is to know the whole world of the story, find it and put it together and make for themselves a coherent narrative. And the third is hopefully to find all the cool stuff. I mean, John has stocked this project with brilliant and twisted and funny little movies. Uh, if you get engaged, if you find a character that you really like, hopefully you'll seek it all out. Uh, in many ways, as we got involved with Psyche Detective, I, I was reminded of an experience that I had when I was in high school when I bought uh, a comedy album by the Monty Python group called Matching Tie and Handkerchief. Uh, that had on one side a double set of grooves. And I played that side eight times and I got the same comedy routines. And the ninth time, the needle dropped in the second set of grooves. And there was 15 minutes I had never heard before. And that was a moment where technology and comedy conspired to blow my little mind. And it was a great experience. And it was a great sensation. And my feeling is that CD-ROMs of this nature hold that potential, that we could be making interactive stories, animated pieces, full motion video pieces, where you pop it in, you don't know where you're going to begin, you don't know where you're going to go, and you certainly don't know how it's going to end. We, you know, we started with looking at the, the puzzle aspect of putting all these pieces together. We, with Jim's brilliant uh, help and yeah, his original right. impulse about jumping into the minds of other people to be somewhere where your body shouldn't, um, we realized that we could take hurdles, it, interface hurdles away from people, and we could give them impulses but instinctually correct material with which they could drive the movie, which, which they could navigate through a realm of character-driven story possibilities. Uh, it occurs to us now that we can up the ante on that quite considerably by going deeper into the story, the world that the characters live in, and the characters. Because everybody connects with those elements and everybody knows the language that we're speaking. It, it's, it's necessary to take the pieces and chop them up even smaller, and it is very necessary for the movie to know how many times you've played it. Uh, listen, before we wrap up, we'd be happy to take some questions. Yeah, back there. About how many hours of playtime do you think the average user will get out of psychic? The 
average user? Eight hundred, nine hundred hours? Yeah. No, 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 no. It's a really <laughs> difficult question to answer. Um, if you want to see all fourteen endings, you know, twenty or thirty hours. I know if we're talking average intelligence, we might stretch that out a little bit more. But the average gamer is a pretty smart customer. Um, Ten to twenty is reasonable. Back there. So I heard a lot of sort of um, confirmational results from playing it on paper before you I guess, super broke the code or something. Um, what did what did you change in your not like based on the feedback from the paper game? One of, one of the things that we tried to do uh, was open up the funnels or the bottlenecks. We realized that, hey, you know, we keep coming to the scene and we're going to come to it every time and people are going to get pretty damn sick of it. So let's, try, we, let's try and open some shattered. of these up. Yeah. And we also built a prototype of the first chapter with um, still images and voiceover and it uh, just voice only between different characters. Um, and it was more of, there was a lot more internal musing on the part of the main character, which we realized we didn't need because that the user, the player, was going to be doing that and was going to be filling in a lot of the blanks. So actually, we, we realized we could take out a great deal that we thought we were going to have to give to people and that they could create their own jumps and leaps between things, that they were the glue between the different puzzle pieces. We also realized that there were some important clues that opened up um, having some abilities in the final Black Diamond game that we needed to make a little easier to find and some that we needed to obscure a little more. Wow. Yeah. How long was your production cycle? Uh, we, the whole thing took a little over two years. Um, I think because we were uh, in very undefined territory. Three months of brainstorming and six months yeah. of writing and 20 days of production and then a year of editing and coding, I think. Yeah, we were working with a proprietary authoring environment that electronics, Electronic Arts created um, and the overlap of post-production and authoring um, was not quite as neatly dovetailed as we would have liked. Um, My obviously, job. What's that? My job. Uh, well, obviously, there was, there's no way to rough cut an interactive movie. So we had all the pieces made, um, and then, oddly enough, I ended up authoring it. But that ended up being pretty cool because I could, if I reached an authoring problem movie-wise, I could quit the authoring environment, go back into Adobe Premiere, recut the movie, and bring it back into the authoring environment. And that proved to be actually a, a fairly interesting way of being able to manipulate these elements. Elements. Way up there in the back row. Uh, yes, you said, I think you addressed this partially, but you talked about finding a way around some of the funnels so that you didn't need to find them necessary. Can you expand on that? Um, oh, they, <laughs> I don't know if, if I meant that they were not necessary. It, it was necessary so that the script did not explode into chaos or thousands of pages. It was necessary at times to shuttle the main character and the player to certain areas. The point is you can do that with one scene that will always be the same. You can do that with an array of scenes and depending upon what that player has done, different ones will play. Or go for a really short scene with a lot of choices right up the bat. I, but in more recent works that, that we have been developing, um, we've just looked at the overall structure in a completely different frame of mind and looked at how to not only create the dramatic modules, um, but how the, the different levels of interaction move them around um, and, and actually change them, as Michael said before, on the fly. And that's, that's one of the things that we're investigating. Are we stuck with the mystery genre? I hope not. No, comedy, uh, thriller, horror, anything you want. Thr thriller, horror still has mystery. Comedy. Comedy. We, we, we want to make comedy. We think we. Well, we think that actually interactive comedy is perfect because you change the setup, you change the joke. I think that there is a, a presupposition right now that because uh, you want it to have one foot at least planted in the game world, that there's got to be a quest 
involved or you know some goal and and I think that often that will shuttle you towards uh, some aspect of mystery to my mind one of the main things to break is uh, supernatural powers I think it's very very easy to traverse this territory and uh, have your choices be about powers I think it's a lot of fun but I think one of the great goals is to go beyond that and create an environment where nobody's really questioning why am I making choices? Why am I tweaking the narrative? Why am I playing God? They're just going ahead and they're doing it. Right, because the, because the drama demands those choices. Actually, a, a mystery seems to hold a, a lot of promise for an interactive thing. I'm trying to figure something out. Um, but one of the pitfalls of mystery is that um, in linear media, um, we accept things that we don't understand in a mystery. We enjoy the f feeling out of touch and out of control because it's it's meant to be um, an eerie feeling that we know will come to a resolution and will be, um, be fixed by the time it's over. Um, an interactive experience needs to have you a little bit more in touch with, I'm on top of what's going on. I mean, you're, you're vacillating all over the place, but it's, it's kind of a delicate balance. And if people feel too out of touch, they're very unsatisfied with the experience. Sherry Gusker. Uh, other than uh, turning 20 days into 40 days, what production things would you have done differently in retrospect? Uh, I wouldn't have turned 20 days into 40 days. That costs a lot of he, money. He wouldn't. He wouldn't let us. We, we were warned very early on. Uh, production things. It's interesting because we've been thinking a lot recently about animation um, and about different kinds of graphic environments for this kind of piece, uh, or you know, for this sort of storytelling um, uh, advance. And the the advantage of live action for certain things is kind of interesting because there's a and I think we communicate it pretty well as you play through it. There's a certain level of phys physicality that I think um, people want. And episodic television, when you get into um, a TV series that you really love, um, there are certain central issues that are always constant and things that change. Um, I would I would go further into that, where you're taking characters, you know, into very weird situations. Uh, we've got a comedy idea in mind in which um, we're, you're t we're, t we're, we're anticipating taking a host of characters into a a number of very far out situations. And, I'm sorry. You know, and that's production, you know, that's real production value. We're out here. We got booted. Thank you very much for coming.